I'm grateful. Um, this week has been a challenging week. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's one of those God is in my face weeks. Um, good old God that he is all up in my business. But um, I appreciate him in my business. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate him checking me and I appreciate him, um, you know, those who love the Lord love correction, you know, you know, fools despise correction. So let's get right at it. I've been um, looking at the word I shared a couple of weeks ago in um, Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, about how Saul, God gave him specific instruction to go do his work and not to bring everybody or anybody back. And he decided, and all any other, destroy the, the wealth and everything. He decided to keep some wealth and also to bring the king back, which was crazy to me. Like, what did, what did he bring the king back for? What was the thing? And um, of course I can read it again. We went over it, but he said he was concerned because the people said we should do this and he didn't want to go against the people. So. I decided I'm going to disobey God, but I'm going to bring back the, the forbidden items that God told me not to bring, and I'm going to worship God with it. See? So it's good. I'm going to disobey you, God, but then I'm going to worship you with it. So it's different. You know, it's not like straight disobeying you. It's kind of semi disobeying you with a twist, right? Twist is, I'm going to bless you with my disobedience to you. How you like that, God? That's a good deal, right? It's a good deal. You know, I know, come on, you, you know what I'm trying to do. God knows my heart. And God's response to him was, well, because you did what I told you not to do, specifically told you not to do. And I want to make sure I, I really clarify this with a strong point. There's times that we do wrong and we don't know. There's times we do wrong, we just made a mistake or we ignorantly thought we understood something we didn't understand. And yet there's, there's a consequence for that, but it's different. But then there's the, no, I did what you specifically told me not to do because I felt better about it or somebody made me feel guilty about not doing it. And so I made myself okay with it by saying to myself, I can now bless you with it. God tore the kingdom from him. And the way that chapter ends, which I won't go into today, not only did God tear the kingdom from Saul, he repented that he ever put him in that position. And the scripture said Saul walked away from him and never visited him again, even up to his death. God never let the prophet even fellowship with him again. And that's crucial because the king or Israel depended on the word of the prophet in order for them to receive correction and direction and, and, and instruction. So that means for the rest of Saul's tenure as king, he was no longer getting direction from God. That means the people were following the king who was not hearing from God and oh my goodness, you understand what I'm saying? Like, you now follow a king that doesn't even hear from God anymore because the prophet no longer speaks to him and hears this nation running off. Um, I feel a little sorry for David when I think about that because he had to inherit a people who had been under a leadership that was not under God's direction. And he had to come in and pick that up. But let's go forward now. I gave you the instruction and I pray that you listen to that message again. It's got a lot of powerful stuff in that you need to get. And that's from two weeks ago. The court obedience is better. Today, I wanna to talk about moving forward. I'm going to set my Bible down for a minute here, and I just want to kind of chat with you. So as I talk to God about the mistakes I've made 
and the things even that he convicted me of this past week. And I talked to him about going forward to the next phase of my life. I wish I could see more of you guys' faces. Come on, if you can give me a face, give me a face. Because I, I, I like your expressions. Listen to this. And this is going to help you, I promise. I immediately came under condemnation of all of my shortcomings. You know, when God shows you that you did something wrong, and then all of a sudden you go to, oh, I feel so bad. Oh my God, I should have done that. I'm so ashamed of myself. And then you want to try to, now you, the devil want to take you back to the history of all the times you did that before, right? And now you're going to start bringing all that up to God. Oh my God, I'm so horrible. And I remember in 1965 and I did that then. And then I did it again in 1972. And God is like, hold up. Can we just deal with what you did yesterday so we can go forward from where you are and stop taking me all the way back to where you were? Come on, somebody can say amen or something to that. Right? God said, like, can we not go through this whole pity party of how you screwed your whole life up? I'm checking you today. Can you just let me check you today without taking me to your guilt journey so that we can go forward? Because the plan of God is to correct you, to take you to the next level, not to take you back to the history of everything you've done wrong. As parents, we can have a problem of doing that. See, my kids see, and you did that before, and remember before when you did that? And you know, it's, it's just this bad thing because we respond to people the way we think God responds to us. So God said to me, I need you to heal from where I'm checking you so we can keep moving to where I'm taking you. It's very powerful. So with that said, I want you to go to Judges chapter six, and we're gonna talk about how we see, how God sees, and what God wants to do. It's, 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 it's very, very, powerful because I'm going to start this message called Moving Forward using Gideon's story as a, as, as a beginning point or foundation point or place of reference. So in Judges chapter six, and this is, this is, you're going to love this. I know you're going to love this. This is, this is, this is some powerful stuff here. You're going to eat very well, and you're going to walk away with some ammunition, some stuff you can really use for the future. So Judges chapter 6, <clears throat> starting at verse 1, starts like this. But the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of, the Midian, of Midian for seven years. And Midian's hand, and the hand of Midian prevailed, against Israel. Because of Midian, the Israelites made themselves dens, which were in the mountains and in the caves and strongholds. Let's take this here. Ready, ready, ready? Where'd my daughter go? Come on back on here, Lima. Come on back, ladies. Come on, come on. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm gonna read it. Now, I, I saw, I read your lips. She said, I was reading the Bible. So she went to the Bible and she, hey, daddy, hey, daddy, I got you. So now watch this. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. Say, they messed up. Say, they messed up. They messed up. They said it right there. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. And as a result of that, he turned them over to the enemy. He let the enemy beat them, control them. I need you to think about this because we see these stories in the Bible all the time, but here's what's deep. Ready? These are the people of God. Highly esteemed in the eyes of God, loved, honored, kings and queens in the eyes of God, God's very children. Where are they now? Living in caves and dens. You know, the separation from God it should be a bad enough, but now you got to go from living in nice, God-like lifestyle to living in caves. You got to go from blessed, prosperous Israel to people hiding out like, like monks and, 
and animals and dens and caves, hiding from these Midianites because these are Midianites, were, they were very oppressive. They were very controlling. If you made any money, they came and took it. If you grew some food in the backyard, they came and took it. They just like, look, your, whatever you do is ours. We take it. These are people who once had a relationship with God that God provided. And now they're in lack and in hiding. Come on out of that cave. Come on out. You don't belong in there. I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself in the message, but I just want to drop that encouraging word right here, right now. You don't belong in that cave. You don't, lo you don't belong hiding and eating scraps and, and trying to get just a little something to eat just before they come and take the rest of it from you. You're not supposed to be sitting at the edge of eviction waiting for the, the, the marshal to come and put you out. I've been in all of those places, but that's not where we belong. Come on up out of that cave. Come up out of there. You don't belong in there. But it says why they were in there, because they did evil in the sight of the Lord. So you want to come out that cave, then first thing we got to do is we got to deal with why you got put in this cave. So let's do this now. Verse three, for that where Israel had sown their seed, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came up against them. And they would camp against them and destroy their crops as far as Gaza, Gaza and leave no nourishment for Israel and no ox or sheep or donkey. So that means they had to do manual labor. Come on now. I'm going to go all into that. Here we go. So they came against them. They took everything they had. And, and if you go on, it says they came up against the cattle and their tents and they came like locusts for the multitude and both of their camels could not be counted. And they wasted the land as they entered it. So it looked like to not only that, they were not only destroying everything they had, they were keeping them from being fed. They were keeping them from having enough to eat so that they could be strong enough to fight back. You know, his, his, Israel had a, a history of butt whipping. You, you gotta understand this now. They had a history of being victorious. They had a name amongst the people. The people all around the world knew about the Red Sea. They may not have had social media, but they got the word around some kind of way about that Red Sea and how that God opened up and swallowed up all of Egypt. And so people knew that when, if Israel was coming against you, it was all but over for you. So their, their plan of attack, because God gave them over because they sinned against him, was to keep them impoverished and hungry and weak so they couldn't fight. That don't sound familiar? We always looking for some handout. We looking for government this and this or that and social this and all of that because we're, and we always say, they keep us under their thumb. No, we stay under there. They not send nobody to your house purposely holding you under there. They say, hey, my thumb is here. It look good, right? Look what's under my thumb and you get under there. I've gotten under there. I don't like being under there. I'm just gonna take a little quick side journey. It's interesting right now watching, and I get to see some of it firsthand, the panic of people running back for jobs now that they're not getting that, that, that pandemic money no more. People, people, you know, people got cars and stuff, they never had a car. Now, they're like, I ain't going back to work, I don't need no job. And now they lining up trying to get any job they can because that money ain't coming. And I'm like, yeah, but see, you got under that thumb and you got comfortable. Now they're yanking it from you. And now you panicked. I'm very careful about that. So watch this. I was getting, let me, I'm going to tell myself, I was getting that pandemic money in the beginning. And I think it was about six, seven weeks and God said, stop doing that. I said, God, that's, that's good money. He said, stop doing that. You don't need it. I'm like, but, I, but it's there. He said, I said, stop doing it. And I was like, all right. But and I didn't say, yes, Jesus, glory, yes. I stopped getting that check. That was a nice thousand dollar a week check. It was nice. But God said, stop doing it. You don't need it. I got you. Stop. Now, I'm not trying to make none of you feel funny. 
That's how did God check me. He made me stop. And I could have said, well, Lord, I'm like, so I'm going to get that pandemic money. But then I'm going to tithe to you, you see? I'm going to pay my tithe. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you 50% of that pandemic money. God said, I told you to stop. I told you to stop. Are you listening to me? The message is tied together. He did wrong against God, and they wound up in trouble. They came and they took everything from them. So verse 7 And when they cried to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites who said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out forth from the house of bondage, which they were in that because they sinned against them, and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you. Did you hear that? and out of the hands of all who oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. Look what God always trying to do. I'm trying to put you in control of stuff. You keep trying to get under people's thumb and work for them. I'm trying to make you a charge. I'm trying to put you to head over, but I can't get you to just be still enough. And I brought you out. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. Say that again. But you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak at Oprah Winfrey, no, no, at Oprah, which belonged to Josh, the, I think that's the Abazite, and his son Gideon was beating wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So he's in there, he's doing what he needs to do to get the wheat ready, but he's got to do it in hiding because again, we just read the Midianites will come in and mess up everything. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty fearless man of courage. And Gideon said, who, me? Who are you talking to? You ain't talking to me. And the Lord said to him, and Gideon said to him, oh, sir, if the Lord is with us, then why has this befallen us? And where are all of his wondrous works of which our fathers told us, saying, did not the Lord bring you up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hands of the Midianites. Okay, so let, let's do this real slow, real quick. Ready? Why is he here? He's saying, if the Lord is with us, and the angel standing right there, because your perception of who you are and where you are is broken based on past experiences. I started this thing by saying, when God convicts you of something, don't start trying to take God back to every time you did wrong in the past all your life. That's what God was saying. So I'm talking about moving forward now. Immediately when God begins to remedy your situation, God hits a roadblock because you immediately want to rehearse your yesterday with God and talk about all the stuff you ever did wrong or go to the shame place that we think we want to go to because we think there's some kind of healing in being shame of ourselves. Oh, you can act like you don't know what I'm talking about, but you do. And so he starts immediately saying to God, wait a minute. Well, if you're really there for us, then why is all this happening? And I heard all these stories of the past, but look at me now and look what thing. And, and he's going, God's going, wait, 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 wait. I don't know if God, had, if he had had the book like we had back then, but all God had to say, read the first verse. It's right there in chapter six, verse one because you're sinned against God and you're disobeyed. This is why you are where you are. You ask him, where's the great stories of where God delivered and did all the great things that he said he used to do? Uh, yeah, he's still here. And now you're crying out to him and he's showing up with an answer, but you can't even see the answer in front of your face because your sin is before you. And then you want to go back to talk about what happened yesterday instead of letting God deal with you where he has you today. 
Here's what I'm saying. Gideon's in a situation right now where the angel is before him, and it's hard for him to see because um, he's he's so caught up in what he's done or what's been done that he can't focus on what God is doing. Forgetting those things which are behind, you press forward to the mark of the high calling. We're going to get more into that next week. But let's talk about this. God is before each one of us right now with a plan for a future. And in that plan for the future, he may rebuke your present. And if he rebukes your present, and then you go into this spiral and want to go back into your whole history. God has to wait for you to finish your whole stupid dissertation and get you past that so he can take you where he wants to take you. See, some of you are grinning right now because you know that I'm telling the truth. We want to go through this whole thing of saying, God, well, if you want to walk me to greatness, I got to first, you got to first wallow with me and myself pity for a while. And God's like, well, yeah, no, I'm no, I'm I'm be right here when you get back. But I'm not going there with you. And if you never come out of that, we're never going to meet up again. And you're never going to where you're supposed to be. So say, I forgive myself for my past failures and sins and shortcomings, and I start today walking with you, God, toward my future. You give him praise for that, because that's a good one right there. So now, we got a situation. God is in front of the man. He's showing the man what he needs from him. And that is for him to just trust me again, because you are where you are because you chose not to trust. You are where you are because you chose to turn your back and go some other kind of way. So, and you appeared to him and called him a mighty man of valor. The Lord is with you. And the angel said, Lord appeared to the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor and courage. And Gideon says to him, Oh, sir, if the Lord is with me, Hmm. Uh, with us, then why has this happened to us? We already covered that. And where are all his wondrous works from which our fathers told us? Well, he's covered that. Did not the Lord bring us out from Egypt? I guess you don't remember anymore. But the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hands of the Midian. Read verse one. And the Lord turned and, and the Lord turned to him and said, "Go this." in your own might, and you shall save Israel from the hands of Midian, from Midian. Have I not sent you? Now, wait a minute. This, this throws me off all the time. Who came to him first? Did it say the angel of the Lord? The angel of the Lord came, is talking to him, and then he makes a statement, and then it says, and the Lord turned to him and said, so sometimes I think they use this angel of the Lord as Christ before the time that he walked the earth and they referred to him because they didn't know that he was the Messiah as the angel of the Lord. Because he said the angel of the Lord was speaking to him. And then when he said this stupid thing, he said, and the Lord turned to him and said, I catch stuff like that. But that's not the point I want to make. Here's the point. You ready for this? He said, but where are all the miracles that we have heard and all this stuff is going wrong and I don't understand why we're here and he went through this whole thing and I thought I was a good Christian, but now look what's happening. And, okay, and his response to him was this. Read that line. And the Lord turned to him and said, go this in your might and you shall save Israel. Now listen to me. That hit me today. He didn't say, and I will make you strong and you will defeat Israel. He said, go in your might. Whose might? 
Yours. Go in your might. He said, you got enough in you already to do what I need you to do. Oh, come on now. Come on, saints, get back in here with me. This is what I'm saying. He said to him, go in your might. Lord, give me strength. Go in your might. Lord, I just feel so weak. Go in whatever you got. I don't feel so strong right now. Go with that anyway. You know why you're not getting the breakthroughs? Because you're waiting for something to happen for you to go forward. And God is telling you, why don't you just go with what you got? I put enough in you. You've been in my word long enough. You've been in my relationship with me long enough. Even though the weakness that you feel right now is more powerful than the strongest man's strength. For when you are weak, I am strong for his strength is perfected in my weakness. Go in your strength. Go in the strength that you have. And with that, he said, you can defeat the Midianites in your weakest state. You can defeat the enemy in your weakest place. You can defeat the enemy. In your weakest place, you're stronger than him. Go in your might. Go in your might. Go in your strength. Get up and move. And if you do, now, let me walk you babies through this real quick. This is powerful. Because I've had some go in your own might experiences lately, and I understand, I'm, getting, I'm getting an understanding of them. They're in a mess because they were in a mess. I don't know how long it took them to cry out, but it looks like it said they're seven years. Finally, somebody cried out enough that God answered. So I'm thinking crying out is not crying, but it's literally repenting or reaching out or, 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 or availing yourself to God for a correction. You caught that? Crying out to God is not crying. It's not feeling pitiful and sorry for yourself, but it's availing yourself to God for direction. I'm crying out saying, help me out. I realize now against you and you only have I sinned. I need some help. It's interesting how God does this, right? Because he doesn't go get some mighty warrior of Israel who can go out there and just stop the Midianites out and ready to go. I, I've been waiting for the word. Let me know. I got my, I got my gap here. We're going to roll. Let's go. He goes find the punkiest man hiding <laughs> in the wine press. He goes and finds the weakest dude of Israel to go make this right. Now, let me say something to you. Let me say something to you. You're listening? The scripture says, for God uses the foolish things to confound the foolish things to confound the wise, the weak things to confound the strong. It's not weird to me that God went and got Gideon, the one that we know we're going to give this sad, horrible story, to show you, are you listening? That I can defeat your enemies with the weakest thing you got around you. I can destroy your enemies with, with, the, with, the, with the weakest power you think you have. You know, I'm not educated. I don't have this. And he's like, I can, I can use the, you right there, right there. With that thing you despise the most, I can do the best thing with it, right there. That thing that you least proud of, I can make you take down mountains with, right there, right there, right there. He goes and he gets this guy who's clearly a coward. He's not a warrior. He's not a powerful dude. And he says, mighty man, mighty man, mighty man of valor. The guy is admitting, like, who are you talking to? Go in your strength. 
If you don't get anything else out of this message, get that. Go in your strength. Stop asking for more. Stop asking God to do something different. Stop asking God to open up all new avenues, give you new connections, open all kind of other doors. Go in the strength you have. Watch what God does. Man, I should wrap it up right there, but it's a little bit more I want to share. But that right there, I'm going to circle back to that to make sure we end the message with that. Go in the strength you got right now. It's all you need. It's all you need. And Gideon said to him, oh, Lord, can I deliver Israel? Okay, so now you know you're talking to the Lord, and the Lord is telling you you can do it, and you're still asking a bunch of stupid questions. But ho, my clan is the poorest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. See, I told you, his family's poor, and he's poor, poorer than the whole rest of the family. His family's the poorest, and he's the lowest on the totem pole in his family. He's saying this. I'm not dissing him. He's saying this by himself. And I'm the least in my father's house. And nobody in my father, and the other, what he's saying, let me just tell you what, let me tell you what he just said. Let me see if you understand it. He just said, my family's poor, and I'm the, I'm the black sheep of the poor family. My own family, my family's poor and they don't respect me because I'm so poor. I'm so poor that they look down on me in their poverty. And the Lord said to him, maybe, huh? surely I will be with you and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. One woman, one person, under the sound of my voice, as the weakest in your family, the least educated, less money, out of all of that, you should still come against whatever enemy that's in front of you and by yourself take them down if you go with God. I want to propose something today. I want us to stop thinking about our background. I want us to stop thinking about where we failed. I want us to stop thinking about how many times we failed. I want us to stop thinking about just how we just don't get along with this and that and that and that. I want us to stop thinking about all of that and say, if God is with me, but I just don't have the connections, I don't know the people. If God is with me, I shall achieve. I shall prevail. And even if I have to do it as one person, I win. He said, you will beat them as one person person, one person only, all I need is you. Say, all God needs is me. And, and I don't feel so strong. Well, neither did this guy. But God said, go in the strength you have. Stop rehearsing everything you've done wrong and how many times you've done wrong every time you get corrected. Say, got that. Check that. See that. Okay. No, but let me explain to you. But you don't understand why. See, because it's the it's the, the face, your facial expression you made, and then it made me feel bad. And so that's why I responded. Could you just stop doing that? Take the correction, make the correction, and go forward and get your promise. You don't need to explain and justify every kind of picking thing. Just make the correction and do it. Especially if it bears witness, just take the correction and go do it and win. When God checked me this week, it was a hard correction. And I said, received. Didn't like it, hurt my feelings, made me feel bad, 
I had to go sit down. I had to go take a walk. I didn't like the person, the way the person said it to me, and, you know. But I had to put all that aside and say, but is it true? And then I said, thanks, appreciate it. I, I need to take a walk. I didn't need to take a walk, I was mad. I need to take a walk because I knew it cut. I knew it cut. I needed to sit with it. I sat with it and I felt all the condemnation and all the past. Remember you did see, see that's your problem. And remember the before, see, and see, and remember before you did it. And that's what ended that relationship. And remember, and God, and God was like, okay, we, we don't need to do all of that. We need to go from here to your, to your destiny. Just say yes to the correction, receive the correction, even if it came from a donkey, receive it and go forward. I sat there and I said, yes. And I slept rough, but I woke up the next morning and I said, that's it, that's it, done, done. That's never gonna be a part of my life story again. And we said, well, that's been a part of your life story most of your life, whatever. And we're today, going forward, I'm a new creature. I received the correction, it's mine. If I slip off the path slightly, I'll catch my foot and pull it back and keep it moving. It's mine. I'm gonna say this to you. Your power and your destiny is yours, but you have to stop licking your wounds about what you did before and what somebody said about you before and you're the weakest in your family and you're the poorest in your family, you're not the smartest in your family, or you are the smartest in your family, everybody expects too much from me and that, 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 that. Whatever the case may be, go in your strength. Go in the strength that you have. Stop praying about the strength you think you need. Go in the strength that you have. Go forward based on what you've already been given by God and trust that that's enough to take you to where he needs you to go next. No shame no more. No guilt, no condemnation. I have to go forward. Destiny's in front of me. I'll give you this as a final thing. I, I eat in a very specific disciplined way right now. Every time you see me, I'm a little bit smaller. Not because I'm trying to lose weight, because I'm trying to be fit, I want to be strong. I'm in the gym now, I'm getting my pump on. I'm working out with a guy half my age. This guy is diesel. Every time me and him work out, he can't work out the next day because he's exhausted. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm here in the gym. Like, you coming or not? Because I'm, he, he's half my age. I need you to understand that. He's 30. I'm 62. And, and I'm stronger, not physically yet, catching him, but I'm stronger in fortitude and drive, and I heal quicker, and I get right. I'm, he's sore. He can't move my, my shoulders. I can't move after this. Well, I'm like, dude, I, I'm ready to do shoulders again today if you want. I'm I'm good. I'm going in the strength. I'm no longer counting my friends. Well, I'm older and it ain't the way it used to be. And this and that. And listen, all of that stuff is off my record right now. You understand what I'm saying? All of that stuff is off my plate right now. All that stuff is dead to me right now. God, tell me what I need to do and I'm doing it. Set it before me and with the strength I have, I'm going to go get it done. If I can't lift 200 pounds, then give me 100 and I'll work with that but I'm going to do it. And if I can't only lift 10, then I'm going to do 10. But let's do it. Stop finding your faults. Stop laying out your failures. Stop counting your shortcomings. Get a hold of the strength that you have and go in it. And if you do, God will meet you. And God said this to me yesterday, and I've quoted it many times. I was down there working out last night, and Kwame and I were on the phone. And I told Kwame, yeah, I'm on the treadmill. I'm getting like, you know, trying to get my time. He said, you on the treadmill? You hate the treadmill. And I said, well, I've been up here for 25 minutes. He said, man. I said, I don't hate it anymore. A month ago, I was saying I hate the treadmill. I'd rather swim in the pool. 
I don't like the treadmill. I don't like the bike. It ain't it don't go nowhere. You walk in, you ain't going nowhere. I need to go somewhere. Like I feel like I'm walking in a circle. I don't like that. But I decided it was necessary. The guy I work out with said, dude, you got to get your cardio in. All this weightlifting is fine. You got to get it in. And I'm like, you know what? Just by a change in my conversation, I don't hate it anymore. Matter of fact, I get on it, I have a good time, time flies by. Kwame used to put me on the treadmill for 10 minutes, I'd be cussing and fussing all the way through the whole 10 minutes. And now I was up there 25 minutes, didn't even realize it. Stop speaking on your weaknesses. Stop speaking failure over yourself. Go on the strength you got. I do it, I love it, and I'm winning at it. And I'm winning at life because I'm choosing. And I know the areas that I'm stuck. Because I can say to God, God, I'm getting stuck here. And he says, okay, you acknowledge that? Yeah. You realize you're stuck there? Yeah. So what's your decision? Not to be stuck no more? There we go. Now get going. And if you slip and you fall off, get back up and keep going. But go in your strength. Because I'm going to end it with this. You're not going to get any more until you go with what you got. God ain't going to give you more if you don't do something with what you have. God ain't going to build you any stronger if you're not willing to lift. Listen, I'm not, I'm just praying and trusting Jesus. Okay, I'm not going to magically lift 100 pounds if I can't lift 10. I'm going to have to stop with the 10. I'm going to have to work my way to that. All this, I just trust the Lord, the Lord will make a way. And what are you doing with him if you go with him? You should destroy the Midianites. What are you doing to start that process? I don't know what to do. Nothing? Could you pull up Google and start searching stuff? Do anything you can with the power that you have. And I promise you, he's going to meet you there and you will destroy Midian as one person. I need a team. You need a team of you and God. And everything else that needs to come into place will come into place when you go in the power that you have and in the strength that's with you. In Jesus' name, amen.